For our first scripture reading, I am going to read a couple of sections from Psalm 119. The first is Psalm 119, verses 33 through 40. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Fulfill your promise to your servant so that you may be feared. Take away the disgrace I dread, for your laws are good. How I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, preserve my law. And then verse 129 to 136. Your statutes are wonderful, therefore I obey them. The unfolding of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. I open my mouth and pant, longing for your commands. Turn to me and have mercy on me, as you always do to those who love your name. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. Redeem me from human oppression, that I may obey your precepts. Make your face shine on your servant, and teach me your decrees. Streams of tears flow from my eyes, for your law is not obeyed. Amen. May the Lord bless his word unto our hearts. Well, please turn with me to Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus 19, and I will read verses 1 through 18. The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the entire assembly of Israel and say to them, Be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Each of you must respect your mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Do not turn to idols or make metal gods for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. When you sacrifice a fellowship offering to the Lord, sacrifice it in such a way that it will be accepted on your behalf. It shall be eaten on the day you sacrifice it or on the next day. Anything left over until the third day must be burned up. If any of it is eaten on the third day, it is impure and will not be accepted. Whoever eats it will be held responsible because they have desecrated what is holy to the Lord. They must be cut off from the, their people. When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not deceive one another. Do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. Do not defraud or rob your neighbor. Do not hold back the wages of a hired worker overnight. Do not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block in front of the blind. But fear your God. I am the Lord. Do not pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. Do not go about spreading slander among your people. Do not do anything that endangers your neighbor's life. I am the Lord. Do not hate a fellow Israelite in your heart. Rebuke your neighbor frankly, so you will not share in their guilt. Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against anyone among your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Amen. May the Lord bless his word to our hearts. Be holy, be devoted to the Lord, and distinct from the world around you. God's people are to take time to be holy. When we lived in Elmira, on certain Sunday mornings, we heard a sound repeated over and over. Clip-clop, clip-clop, clip-clop. It was horses. Numerous horses pulling buggies with people in the buggies down the road. In that region, there are many Mennonites, and on Sunday morning, they were headed to worship. They would vary their meeting places, and once every two or three weeks, they met at a chapel close to our home, and the road became a thoroughfare for horses and buggies. Why are they traveling in such a way? What are they doing? Well, their understanding of holiness and their desire to live differently and distinct from the world led them to believe that it is wrong to drive a car. Other Mennonites interpret things differently and say that cars are okay 
but they cannot be attention-seeking cars, so they are all to be black and without chrome. Well, what does holiness look like? Does it mean horses and buggies? Does it mean plain cars and plain clothing? The exhortation of Leviticus 19.2, Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy, is embedded in a section of Leviticus which goes from chapter 17 to chapter 20. In this section, God speaks to Abraham and to all of the Israelites, giving them details about what it means to be his people. He describes for us what holy living looks like. And these words are not just relevant for the Israelites 3,500 years ago, but for us, for God's people today in the 21st century. We will reflect on this command to be holy under three headings. The call to holiness, the extent of holiness, and the source of holiness. The call to holiness. The call of God to his people is to pursue holiness, to make every effort to live a holy, a godly, a righteous life in this present age. And as I said, this command is not just for the ancient Israelites. We need to take note of this verse ourselves because it is repeated and applied to the church by the Apostle Peter. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. And not only does Peter quote that verse, but the emphasis on holiness and living for Christ permeates the New Testament. It is what we are to do as his followers. We are to prioritize holiness. We are to be holy. We are to be holy, God says, because he is holy. And did you notice the repetition in Leviticus 19 when I read it? At the end of many of the verses are the words, I am the Lord. It is because God is the Lord that they are to conduct themselves in such a manner. We are to be holy because he is holy. The first sermon in this series on Leviticus was also on this verse, Leviticus 19, verse 2. In that sermon, we focused on God's holiness. And we cannot rightly understand the book of Leviticus, the scriptures as a whole, God's plan of salvation, or his expectation of us if we do not have a biblical understanding of the holiness of God. God is holy. There is none like him. He is wonderfully unique. He is the glorious eternal being who created all things out of nothing. He is the one who dwells in unapproachable light. He is highly exalted. He sits on the throne of the universe. He is so great that he must stoop down to look upon things in heaven or on earth. He is the one who can do all things. And this God, this holy, magnificent God, dwells among the nation of Israel. And he has promised to bless them, to be their God, to help them, to deliver them, to provide for them, to protect them, and to bring them into a land flowing with milk and honey. What, amazing, what an amazing thing it is to belong to God's special people. However, his people also have great responsibilities. The Lord makes it clear that they are his people. Their lives are to reflect the Lord that they love and serve. They are not to be like the other nations, but they are to shine as lights in the world because they know and because they are loved by God. And likewise, we are to be holy. Our relationship with the true and living God is to affect our lives, our behavior, our words, our attitudes, our relationships are to reflect our love and devotion to God. The principle is that those who know God, the pure and the upright God, those who are in a relationship with him are to be different than those who do not know him. Knowing God is to have a clear and evident impact on our lives. I have been rereading books which contain stories from the persecuted church. And in one account, a wife was very concerned for her husband. She knew that if his devotion to Jesus was discovered, it would cost him his life. And he tried to assure his wife not to worry that he would be cautious. But she responded in saying that it wouldn't matter because the fruit of the Spirit, joy, peace, love, were so evident in his life 
that even the dullest of people can see that a change has occurred. His relationship with Jesus radiates from him. That's the way it should be. The Apostle Peter writes, Dear friends, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they may accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. It's 1 Peter 2, 11 and 12. People are to see that those who follow God are different. Our goodness and purity and godliness should be undeniable. We are to be men and women of character and integrity whose lives reflect the morally perfect God that we serve. Jerry Bridges writes, Holiness is not a series of do's and don'ts, but conformity to the character and obedience to the will of God. We are called to be holy. We are called to reflect the character of God in our lives. We are called to be holy because our precious God and Savior is holy. The call to be holy. Our second point is the extent of holiness. This call to be holy in chapter 19 is, as I have said, embedded in a section of laws and prohibitions. And these give the Israelites insight into what God means when he calls on them to be holy. Well, how do these laws and rules from chapters 17 to 20 apply to us today? And a few weeks ago, we talked about the three divisions of the Old Testament law. So hopefully you can remember when we had that graphic on the screen inside the church. There's three aspects, three divisions of the Old Testament law. There's the civil law. Every society needs a form of civil government. And the civil law gives the Israelites divine instructions on how they are to function and exist in community as a nation. So there are rules for a safe, healthy, orderly society. And many of the laws that would fall under the, uh, the category of civic laws are focused on how they were to live uh, as their society all those years ago. And they don't necessarily apply uh, in the same way to us today. Although we can still glean uh, biblical and wise principles from them. There is a cer- the ceremonial law. So the civil law, the ceremonial law. And this law teaches the people how they are to worship God. And the ceremonial aspect of the law describes the sacrifices and the work of the priests and so on. And these rules were designed to point the way to Christ. And so we don't offer sacrifices anymore. We don't have a priesthood in the same way anymore because these things were anticipating the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and have been fulfilled in him. And thirdly, there's the moral law. So the civil law, the ceremonial law, and the moral law. And the moral law, these are universal rules and regulations which are unchanging because they flow from the moral character of God. And God does not change. So some of his commands, some of the commands, are true of every individual, every society. Rules, these are rules that are designed to reflect the character of God. Now the laws and regulations in chapters 17 through 20 flow from each of these three divisions. Some some of the laws are civil, some are ceremonial, and some are moral. In other words, some of the laws should be followed by us exactly as they are stated, and others, though instructive, are not required for holiness in the 21st century. For example, in Leviticus 19, verse 15, they are told not to pervert justice. Do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the great, but judge your neighbor fairly. This is part of the moral law. This law reflects the moral character of God. God is just, and it is always wrong and offensive to him to see justice perverted. If we are to be holy, then we are to follow this law as it is written, because God does not change. But a few verses later, Leviticus 19.19 includes the clause, Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material. Well, does that standard of holiness apply to us? And if it did, how many of us would be breaking the law at this very moment? Well, this command was designed to emphasize the holiness of the priesthood. Some of the priestly garments were made of mixed fabric, and such a garment was only for the priests, 
not for the common people. Today, such a law or requirement is unnecessary. We do not have priests, but we do exalt and glorify our perfect, unique High Priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. To help us understand the degree to which each law and regulation applies to us today, we can ask questions like, what is the purpose of the particular law? Is the regulation part of the moral, civil, or ceremonial law? What does the rest of the scripture, including the New Testament, teach us about the subject? In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says that all of the law and the prophets point to him. So we can ask, how is this law? fulfilled in Christ? Or what does the teaching of Christ bear upon this particular law, rule, or regulation? Well, let us do a brief overview of these four chapters to see what we can learn from what is expected of the Israelites as they are called to be holy as God is holy. And we begin with chapter 17, which is a transitional chapter. On the one hand, it looks back to the first 16 chapters of Leviticus in that it deals with matters relating to blood, sacrifice, rituals, and impurity, so aspects of the ceremonial law. On the other hand, it joins with the next three chapters because it is addressed not only to the priests, but it is also addressed to the people as a whole, the people in general. And the focus of chapter 17 is the sanctity of blood. And first, in verses 3 through 7, the people are told that they must slaughter certain animals at the altar in front of the tabernacle. Even if it is meat that is to be used for dinner, they must kill it in the right place and in the right manner. And the purpose of this law is to curtail the worship of idols. One writer notes that polytheism, the worship of many gods, is the cultural air in which the Israelites lived. At that time, the people and nations all around them worshipped many gods. But not so for the Israelites. They were to be holy and worship the one true God. And to that end, any animal that was generally used as a sacrifice in the worship of the true God or of these false gods was only to be killed at the altar, not in any other place to ensure that it would not be sacrificed to a false god. And we likewise are to have an exclusive relationship with God. We are not to follow or succumb to the thinking and ways of the world, but we are to worship God and God alone. And next, they are given regulations concerning other sacrifices in verse 8 and 9. A burnt offering is to be brought to the tabernacle, and anyone who sacrifices an offering in a disobedient manner will be cut off. And this reminds us that God is a consuming fire, and he is to be worshipped with reverence and awe. The third focus of this chapter is on the eating of blood, and this is a practice which would have been present in the nations around them. And there are two reasons why it is wrong to eat blood. First, because the life of the creature is in the blood, and so blood belongs to the Lord, because the life of the animal is in the Lord's hands. And to refrain from eating blood is to recognize that all life belongs to the Lord. And second, blood has been given to them for the sake of atonement. The process of atonement, which we saw a couple weeks ago in chapter 16, is special and important. And the essence of atonement is one dying, one shedding their blood in the place of another. Blood is shed. Life is given to redeem and ransom. So blood is precious. It is given for atonement. It is not given for human consumption. And this prohibition against eating blood pertains not only to sacrificial animals, but as we learn in verses 13 and 14, it applies to animals that are killed during the hunt as well. And the, emph and the emphasis of the final laws in this chapter concern those who eat an animal that has died naturally or that has been killed by another animal. It is not forbidden to eat such an animal. However, the one who does so will need to wash their clothes and will be unclean until evening. It is not wrong or to be impure or to be in a state of ceremonial uncleanness, but what is wrong is not to deal with it. They are to deal with their sin and with anything that would make them unclean and deal with it quickly. 
as we move on to chapter 18, the focus is on the sanctity of sex. Sexual immorality and idolatry go hand in hand. When people and nations create their own gods, their own religion, and construct their own ethical standards, they will inevitably involve sexual immorality. God's clear desire, on the other hand, is for his people to be sexually pure. And we show our devotion to God and our commitment to him by striving for righteousness and purity in the area of sexuality. The topic of sexual purity is always a relevant topic. It is one thing that we, like the people of Israel, need to be challenged with. We are to take our understanding of sexual ethics and what is acceptable and appropriate, not from the world, but from the Lord. And Lord willing, we will come back to this topic next week. For now, we will move on from chapter 18 and then revisit it next Sunday with a sermon on the topic of holy sexuality. Chapter 19. Chapter 19 is a little different from the previous two chapters in that there is not one major topic that is addressed, but many topics. And what unites the verses in this chapter is that the prohibitions flow from the Ten Commandments. In this chapter, the Ten Commandments are stated, explained, and applied. As a result of the focus on the Ten Commandments, the people are taught in this chapter that being holy means that they are to respect their parents, observe the Sabbath, turn from idols, and care for each other. A key exhortation in this section is the timeless command, love your neighbor as yourself, verse 18. And many of the commands in the chapter explain what that looks like. It means leaving food in your fields for the poor and foreigners. It means being honest. It means being compassionate towards the disabled. It means treating slaves as people, not as property. And it means respecting your elders. In addition, there are exhortations which remind them that they are to worship only God and to look to him alone for guidance and wisdom so they are not to practice divination or consult mediums. They are not to act like the other nations and mourn for the dead as others do because God is sovereign over life and death. There is even a law that pertains to how they are to cut their hair and clip their beards. And it's not that God wants them to be fashionable, but he wants them to be distinct from the other nations and not to look like those who are corrupted by paganism and worldliness. They are to be a holy and righteous people inside and out. And that brings us to chapter 20, which reviews many of the laws already given, but this time associates punishment with them. And though many of these commands are moral in nature, they would fall under the moral law, the punishments would be considered part of the civil law. How the nation of Israel were commanded to punish a certain offense is not necessarily how it is to be punished today. This chapter begins with an indictment against the offering up of children to the false god named Molech. And there are numerous reasons why this practice is so utterly offensive to God. It's offensive because they are not to worship false gods. It is offensive because they are not to participate in the practices of the world. It is offensive because it devalues life. It is offensive because it does not appreciate the precious gift that children are. Children are to be selflessly cared for and nurtured by their parents, not cruelly sacrificed for the supposed benefit of the parents and society. And if you read chapter 20, verses 1 through 5, there are principles in this section which apply to the abomination of abortion in our day. Abortion which likewise devalues life, which does not recognize the gift that children are. And the people are not to sit idly by while children are killed. Verse 4, if the members of the community close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Molech, and if they fail to put him to death, I myself will set my face against him and his family and will cut them off from their people, together with all those 
together with all who follow him, in prostituting themselves to Molech. You cannot miss how passionately God speaks about the murder of defenseless children in this passage. And so we must speak out against abortion. And we must support pregnancy and resource centers. They're doing a necessary and godly work as they seek to minister to women and families who are in crisis. And as they strive to counteract the lies of the devil and the lies of the world. Well, may we be willing to play our part. In the rest of the chapter, many exhortations are revisited. They are not to turn to spiritualists. They are to honor their parents. And the one that receives the most space is that they are to be sexually pure. And what sets this chapter apart is that in this section, punishments are given and described for those who have failed to prioritize holiness. And what we learn from this chapter and the section as a whole is that sin is serious. Sin among the Lord's people must be addressed. And those who continue in sin will experience the Lord's justice. These are sobering words. The people are told that they are to be holy so that they may live in the land. A failure to prioritize holiness will mean danger for the individual because many of the offenses that are listed are capital offenses. They carry with it um, a punishment of death. And they are also to prioritize holiness because if they do not, then there is danger for the community. Because as chapter 20 says, the land will vomit them out if they are not devoted to God. Verse 26 is a summation verse. You are to be holy to me because I, the Lord, am holy and I have set you apart from the nations to be my own. These chapters make it clear that there is to be no immorality among God's people. The law forces us to take sin seriously because God takes it seriously. Leviticus teaches us of God's perfect righteousness and our own insufficiency and need of a Savior. The law exposes sin as exceedingly sinful and earning severe consequences. The law reminds us that we are all deserving of punishment. And the punishment for sin is death. But God did not leave us in a sorry state. He provided a Savior so that we might be forgiven. We are to remember that the law teaches us the principle of an atoning sacrifice. The seriousness of sin is exposed so that the remedy, the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, might be appreciated. Jesus is the crucified Savior. He is the sufficient Savior. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The law demands punishment. The holiness of God demands punishment. But Jesus died in the place of his people. Did he die for you? Have you repented of your sins and trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation? And the scriptures make it clear that there is no other Savior. We can't earn heaven by ourselves. Our righteousness is completely inadequate. The law makes that crystal clear. But Christ is sufficient. His blood can cleanse the foulest sinner and wash us as white as snow. And so we are to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. And we are to flee from sin and pursue holiness. And as we do so, we are to remember that holiness comes from the Lord. We've seen the call to holiness. God's people are called to be holy. The extent of holiness, as we've summarized chapters 17 through 20, we've seen areas that are highlighted, areas in which we are to be holy. And now the source of holiness. We are called to be holy, but God's standards are so high, and we are so prone to fall. How can we live holy lives in this world? We look at Peter and we see how he failed to stand up for Jesus on the night of his betrayal. And if Peter failed, how can we then live for God in this world? How can we keep ourselves 
pure from immorality when temptation is all around us? Well, there is a very important text in this section, and it's Leviticus chapter 20, verse 8. Keep my decrees and follow them. I am the Lord who makes you holy. In this verse, they are once again exhorted to keep the decrees of the Lord. They are to follow his paths, the paths of righteousness. The responsibility of God's people is to obey him. The verse continues and says that he is the Lord who makes us holy. He is the one who makes us holy. This past week, I've been reading through The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. And if you have never read this book, then I encourage you wholeheartedly to read it. The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. And he begins the book by highlighting the tension between God's sovereign work in our holiness and our, per and our personal responsibility to mature in the faith. And this is a very appropriate illustration given our setting this morning. This is what Jerry Bridges writes. A farmer plows his field, sows the seed and fertilizes and cultivates, all the while knowing that in the final analysis he is utterly dependent on forces outside of himself. He knows he cannot cause the seed to germinate, nor can he produce the rain and sunshine for growing and harvesting the crop. For a successful harvest, he is dependent on these things from God. Yet the farmer knows that unless he diligently pursues his responsibilities to plow, plant, fertilize, and cultivate, he cannot expect a harvest at the end of the season. In a sense, he is in a partnership with God, and he will reap its benefits only when he has fulfilled his own responsibilities. Farming is a joint venture between God and the farmer. The farmer cannot do what God must do, and God will not do what the farmer should do. So in other words, if the farmer doesn't cultivate and plant and sow and everything, then it's not going to happen. We can say just as accurately that the pursuit of holiness is a joint venture between God and the Christian. No one can attain any degree of holiness without God working in his life. But just as surely, no one will attain it without effort on his own part. God has made it possible for us to walk in holiness, but he has given us the responsibility of doing the walking. He does not do that for us. We are to pursue holiness, and we can do so with confidence knowing that God is at work in us. The scriptures tell us that God, who has begun a good work in us, will carry it on to the day of completion. It is by his power and ability and strengthening that we have the resources to live according to his standards. The Lord gives his people the ability to obey. One writer says, sanctification, so personal holiness, cannot be achieved by sheer human effort because only God can sanctify. And how does God do this? How does he make us holy? Well, through the work of the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised to send the Spirit to his followers. And the Apostle tells us that every believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. He is doing the work of sanctification, the work of making us more and more holy. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 and 8. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. The Spirit has been given to us by God to empower us and equip us that we might become more and more holy, that we might increasingly resemble our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we are instructed to keep in step with the Spirit, to walk in conjunction with the Holy Spirit. Or on the flip side, Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. We are to pursue righteousness and a walk with the Spirit who empowers believers. And essential to our growth, a key means that the Spirit uses to cause us to mature spiritually, a key means for our sanctification is the Word of God. The Spirit uses the Bible to mature us. In chapter after chapter of The Pursuit of Holiness, Jerry Bridges emphasizes the essential place of the Scripture in our spiritual maturity and our growth in holiness. To be holy, we must be reading, studying, and memorizing the Scriptures. 
If we do not saturate our hearts and our minds with God's word, then we will not be growing in holiness. God has given to us his word and the Holy Spirit. We have the resources that we need. We have the enabling from God, the God who causes us to grow in holiness. And so we are to use them. We are to prioritize holiness. Another writer notes, while obedience to the law isn't God's way of salvation, a love for holiness and a desire to obey and please God are certainly evidences that we are children of God. Well, let us conduct ourselves as loving, devoted, grateful children. Let us love what our Heavenly Father loves, righteousness, goodness, peace, and joy. Let us be holy. Let us strive for holiness because our wonderful Heavenly Father is holy. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. And our Father, this is a very challenging message and thought that we are to be holy and the standard that is given is you. We are to be holy as you are holy. And our Father, you have given us the resources that we might pursue holiness so that we might grow. But our Father, we also recognize that all too often we fall. We sin. We do not prioritize holiness as we ought. And our Father, we thank you that there is forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father, we repent. We ask for your forgiveness. And our Father, we thank you that you pick us up again and you encourage us and you motivate us to persevere. Help us to do that. Help us to press on. Help us to be holy for your honor and for your glory, for the good of our families, for the good of our church, and for our personal blessing. Help us to prioritize holiness in Jesus' name. Amen.